Good evening, everyone. I'm Andy Lascano. This year, we started a new segment in partnership with retired CCISD history teacher Robert Parks. Once a week, we have brought you a new piece of Coastal Bend history, and tonight, well, tonight we're going to look back at some of our favorites. From concept to construction, it was one of a kind. The old Memorial Coliseum on Shoreline was a wonder of its time. It began in the 1950s when the city decided to build a new civic complex along the bayfront. The initial plans called for two parks, a new city hall, an exposition hall, and an event center. And they contracted with architect Richard Colley to design it. So he chose a barrel-shaped building for the Coliseum because, as he said, quote, a box-like conventional building would look like hell here, end quote. So construction began in 1953, and in September of 54, it was dedicated in honor of the 400 Nueces County natives who gave their lives in World War II. The Lamella roof design utilized steel, arches, anchored in the ground for support, allowing for every seat in the building to have an unobstructed view because there weren't any supports on the inside. The 244 span of unsupported roof was the longest in the world at the time. The design and construction earned worldwide recognition. The nearly complete Civic Auditorium was dedicated as the Memorial Coliseum, September 26, 1954. It was the highlight of a three-day convention of the Gold Star Mothers and included a memorial plaque listing the more than 400 men and women of Nueces County who lost their lives in World War II. Over the next 50 years, the Coliseum would become the primary event center in Corpus Christi, a central figure in the lives of many Corpus Christi natives who would see their first circus, the ice capades, sporting events like the Harlem Globetrotters and hockey games, rock concerts, car shows, eventually their high school proms and graduations, all in the same unique building. But by the late 1990s, it was clear our growing city would soon need a much bigger auditorium. And on November 3rd of 2002, ground was broken on the American Bank Center. The new building would seat twice as many people as the Memorial Coliseum. And when the new auditorium opened, Memorial Coliseum was closed and boarded up. For six years, the fate of the Coliseum was a heated public debate. Numerous ideas and proposals brought forth, but none were solid enough to meet city council approval. City staff recommended the building be demolished, which set off protests from veterans groups. Petitions circulated to save the building. Lawsuits threatened. On February 23rd of 2010, the Corpus Christi City Council voted to demolish the building. And in May of the same year, the demolition began. The walls began tumbling down. The city would later use the land to make what is now Waters Edge Park. When the demolition began, crews piled the debris in what used to be the parking lot for the Coliseum and Exposition Center. Many Corpus Christi residents couldn't help but take a few souvenirs, including sections of the old brick walls. All that's left of the Memorial Coliseum is a monument to soldiers killed in World War II at Cheryl Veterans Memorial Park. In June 1845, the citizens of the Republic of Texas voted to approve annexation to the United States as the 28th state. That lit the match to a boundary dispute between Mexico and the U.S. Troops were deployed from across the country to the U.S.-Mexico border. On September 12, 1845, the steamship Dayton, carrying U.S. troops under the command of General and future President Zachary Taylor, exploded in Corpus Christi Bay. Eight men died. Their bodies brought ashore for burial, and General Taylor selected the top of the highest nearby hill as their final resting place. The eight men were buried under a large mesquite tree. The site became the primary burial site for the city of Corpus Christi for more than four decades. Often referred to as the graveyard, Bayview Cemetery became the final resting place for many of Corpus Christi's earliest settlers. Seven of the city's earliest mayors are also buried there, including our first mayor, Benjamin Neal. Veterans of five different wars, including the Texas Revolution, are also buried there. 
By 1900, Bayview Cemetery was largely neglected and forgotten, but the grounds were cleaned up by a group of ladies who formed the Bayview Cemetery Association. They also raised money for its continued maintenance. In 1912, newspaper publisher Eli Merriman took over the association's mission and worked tirelessly to publicize the historical importance of the cemetery. And 13 years later, he convinced city leaders to take over ownership. Nearly 100 years later, the city's Parks and Rec Department still maintains the land, and just this year, a new marker was dedicated naming the Old Bayview Cemetery to the National Register of Historic Places. For Coastal Bend History, I'm Andy Lascano. Favorite Coastal Bend history stories from the past year. Did you know that it was a mistake, a simple mistake that led to the creation of one of Corpus Christi's most beautiful municipal parks? Of course, many of you here in the Coastal Bend have been to Cole Park. So today, retired CCISD history teacher Robert Parks is going to explain the story behind Cole Park. Over the years, Cold Park has grown into a massive recreation area along the bayfront and an iconic tourist attraction. Hard to believe, in the beginning, it was just six acres of land. In 1926, a city employee accidentally plowed the six acres, which belonged to real estate developer E.B. Cole. Cole came to Corpus Christi in 1890 and developed a huge tract of land that today houses the Delmar, Lindale, and Six Points neighborhoods. When the employee mistakenly plowed the land, Cole could have sued the city, but instead, he offered to donate it as long as the city agreed to build a public park on the site and guarantee it would remain a park in perpetuity. So in June of 1930, the city formally accepted the land, said to be valued at $40,000 at the time. Nowadays, that would be closer to three quarters of a million dollars. Three years later, the city would satisfy the requirements and have the land officially transferred to them. A year after that, a massive pier was built on the property, and the next year, lighting was installed. In 1936, E.B. Cole donated nearly $1,000 for a formal park entrance sign to be installed bearing his name. The park would be formally dedicated on April 23, 1939, E.B. Cole's 83rd birthday, and it became an instant hit with the public. Years later, the park would undergo a massive redevelopment and expansion, and we'll get into that next week. There has been some recent controversy over the naming of the park after E.B. Cole, and we've covered some stories about the NAACP trying to have it renamed. If you'd like to see that story or read more from Mr. Robert Parks, you can scan this QR code. For Coastal Bend History, I'm Andy Lascano. Remember, last week we told you about the history, the humble beginnings behind Cole Park. How it was a simple mistake by a city worker that was the catalyst behind the creation of Cole Park. Well, today retired CCISD history teacher Robert Parks is going to tell us everything that went behind, went on behind the scenes to make Cole Park, Cole Park. When Cole Park was formally dedicated in 1936, it included a swimming and fishing pier, a goldfish pond, and more. But by the early 1960s, it had fallen into disrepair. In 1945, the pier had been destroyed by a hurricane. Tall weeds covered it. The goldfish pond had fallen apart. The woods had been removed to expand Ocean Drive. In 1961, the retaining wall at the water's edge had been destroyed by Hurricane Carla. In 1966, the Corpus Christi City Council approved a project to expand the park behind a new retaining wall using fill from the bay and dirt from the expansion of Agnes and Laredo Streets. Cole Park grew to 26 acres total by the end of the project three years later. And then in 1973, the Bicentennial Project began bringing a new 500-foot concrete fishing pier and the iconic 1800 square foot bicentennial amphitheater. On July 4th, 1976, it was the site of a huge patriotic concert and fireworks show celebrating the 200th birthday of our country. The amphitheater continues to host band and orchestra concerts and performances of all kinds, including the annual Easter sunrise service. 
In 1991, the Junior League built Kids Place, a huge wooden playground built by dozens of volunteers. And in 2006, they added the 10,000 square foot skate park. That skate park has been renovated twice. And just last year, the city rebuilt the 1973 pier because of damage caused by Hurricane Harvey in 2017, adding additional parking and lighting, as well as a brand new sign. So, Cole Park continues to evolve. As you can see right now, the work that they're building, the new playground, the new splash pad, the city also has plans for future enhancements as Cole Park nears its 100th birthday. If you'd like to see that story or read more from Mr. Robert Parks, you can scan this QR code. It will open our Coastal Bend history page where you can find many other articles by Mr. Parks. Or you can just go to our website, ChrisTV.com, and click the Coastal Bend history tab. For Coastal Bend History, I'm Andy Lascano. Some would argue the Art Center of Corpus Christi on Shoreline is itself a work of art, but it wasn't always so prestigious. In fact, it had a much more humble beginning. Flashback to 1941 when the city of Corpus Christi donated land to the United States government. They spent nearly $80,000 to build a recreation center for cadets and sailors arriving as Naval Air Station Corpus Christi was being built. The United Services Organization, better known as the USO, staffed the center at no cost to the government. Throughout World War II, it served as a home away from home for NAS personnel and had plenty of perks, a ballroom for dancing and live entertainment, areas to play chess, checkers, cards, or maybe shoot a little pool. They had a game room for that as well. Well, a few years after the war ended, the USO pulled up stakes and closed the facility. Its last day in operation was March 16, 1947. But the building was called back into service later that year, turned over to the American Legion and used as a recreation center for veterans. A little more than a decade later, Nueces County bought the building for $65,000 and turned it into the county tax office. But then in 1977, the county sold the building to the city, which needed some space for city hall operations. And after some remodeling, it became a city hall annex. 10 years later, Another transformation. The old USO building would leave civil service behind. The Corpus Christi City Council voted to donate the building to the art community, but only if they would bring it up to code. The art group collected $250,000 for renovations, which began in late May of 1988, and that's when it became what is now the Art Center of Corpus Christi, a transformation that its original owners might have considered a stroke of genius. On September 14, 1919, Clyde Simpson carried his six-year-old son Robert through the flooded streets of downtown Corpus Christi during the deadliest hurricane in the city's history. They were trying to reach the elementary school where Robert was registered to take shelter, but they never got there. That turned out to be a stroke of luck for them because that building collapsed and everyone inside drowned. Clyde and his son didn't make it to the Nueces County Courthouse where they rode out the storm. And when it was over, more than 357 people were dead, 286 of them in Corpus Christi. One member of Clyde Simpson's family was among the dead, but Simpson, his wife, and his son Robert survived. That storm spiked a lifelong interest in weather for Robert, who graduated near the top of his class from Corpus Christi High School in 1929. And by 1933, four years later, he had earned his master's in physics from Emory University. Then an economic storm changed his life. During the height of the Great Depression, Simpson returned to Corpus Christi, became the director of music for Corpus Christi High School, and in 1940 accepted a job with the U.S. Weather Bureau in Brownsville. Two years later, he moved to the Weather Bureau in New Orleans as World War II broke out. Robert Simpson realized how important forecasting was during wartime, and thanks to his fascination with it, he was instrumental in creating the Army Air Force Weather School, where he made his first flight into the eye of a hurricane on board an aircraft. After the war, he moved to the Weather Bureau headquarters in Miami, and after the devastating 1954 hurricane season that saw 16 storms cause nearly a billion dollars in damage and kill more than 1,000 people, Simpson secured funding for hurricane research and was appointed 
Director of the National Hurricane Research Project in Washington, D.C. We continue a look at some of our favorite Coastal Bend history stories from the past year. Orville and Wilbur Wright made their historic first flight in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina on December 17, 1903. A decade later, on New Year's Day 1914, the very first commercial airline flight took off from St. Petersburg, Florida. Just 15 years later, Corpus Christi would have its first airport, and it was all born from a desire to be included on a new airmail route between Atlanta, Georgia, and Mexico City. But before that could happen, before they could be included with other cities like Houston and Brownsville, Corpus Christi had to come up with the money and then a way to build an airport. A World War I pilot helped bring that to reality. Cliff Moss, who owned the Texas Airplane Corporation, drafted plans for the municipal airport in April 1928. Voters approved $50,000 for construction, and with that money, the city bought 170 acres of land on Old Brownsville Road for the project. Construction began in July of the same year. The first four airplanes housed at the airport were all owned by the Texas Airplane Association. They included two crop dusters, a flight instruction plane, and just one reserve for passengers. Moss was even named first airport manager, a position he held until 1934 when he left for another job. Then in 1935, he died in a plane crash. Two months later, the city of Corpus Christi renamed the airport for him. Moss Field would serve Corpus Christi until 1960 when the new Corpus Christi International Airport was built. The land off Old Brownsville Road now houses the Corpus Christi State School and the Gabe Lozano Golf Center. The rest of the original airport has faded into history, except for one of the original runways. In the years following World War II, Corpus Christi's population was exploding. New schools were needed in a hurry. W.B. Ray High School was opened in 1950, but within three years, it was evident another high school would be needed. So in 1953, the Corpus Christi Independent School District purchased 30 acres of land for a new high school, which would later become Mary Carroll High School. The school is named after the first and only female superintendent, Miss Mary Carroll. She started as an 18-year-old Spanish teacher in CCISD schools in 1901 and later served as superintendent of the district from 1922 to 1933. Unlike Miller and Ray, the new Carroll High School was built in an open corridor design that became popular with new schools in the 50s. When completed, the new high school received national recognition for its design. Carroll High School began its first year on September 3, 1957. There weren't any seniors in the first class of 530 students and only 18 faculty members. The first year was difficult because the campus was outside city limits, surrounded by open fields that did not drain well when it rained. So Carroll, like most schools in Corpus Christi, was not air conditioned, so mosquitoes and bugs and heat were a nightmare. The open wing design was perfect for taking advantage of the cross breezes, making the situation tolerable. Months before the school opened, a special committee of future Carroll High School students and teachers had selected the tiger and blue and white as the school's mascot and colors. Now, 66 years later, the doors of the original campus have been closed forever. The new campus on Saratoga has been open for a full year now, and the story of Carroll High School continues. Bernardo F. Garza was born in Brownsville in 1892, but he was raised in Rockport, then moved to Corpus Christi in 1914, where he first worked as a waiter. But in 1920, he and a group of partners bought the Metropolitan Cafe on Chaparral, kicking off a successful career as a businessman and property owner. And as he worked, he became acutely aware of discrimination and segregation of Hispanic citizens and became involved in the efforts to correct it. He was named president of Council No. 4 of the Sons of America and became the driving force behind the unification of all Hispanic civil rights groups into a united front. In fact, at a convention in May of 1929, 
He helped create the League of United Latin American Citizens, or LULAC. He was its first president. And in the span of just a few years, he not only testified before Congress against the bill that would have legalized the segregation of Hispanic students in schools, he also worked to bring civil rights to his community. He was forced to close the cafe that started his careers in 1931, and by 1933, he entered a sanitarium for tuberculosis, the disease that eventually killed him on February 21st, 1939, at only 44 years old. City Hall and the Nueces County Courthouse were both closed for his funeral. Flags were lowered to half-staff. More than 100 honorary pallbearers were on hand for his burial at Rose Hill Cemetery. Even the White House sent a representative. For Coastal Bend History, I'm Andy Lascano. If you head north from the USS Lexington on Surfside Boulevard, you'll come across an RV park with an unusual sign near the intersection of Surfport Avenue and Timmin Boulevard. It's a 15-foot tall milk bottle, and it's much older than you might think. It was originally located at 520 Belden near the old Nueces County Courthouse at Grisham's Ice Cream Company. Ben Grisham opened the company in 1929 and his angel food ice cream was said to be the smoothest and best in town. The 15 foot tall milk bottle made of reinforced concrete stood in front of the plant and well it acted as a sign plus there was a single room inside where they sold ice cream out of. In 1937 Ben Grisham expanded the Belden Street plant and moved the giant bottle to North Beach because well that was the most popular place in town. It was placed on property owned by Mrs. Beatrice Anderson, who ran a trailer park at the location. The Grisham brand of ice cream was so popular, it sold at every grocery store and soda fountain in Corpus Christi. They even had a contract with the CCISD. Tragically, Mr. Grisham would die from a massive heart attack just a few years later. So in December of 1951, the Grisham's brand name was sold to Cars, Milk, and Ice Cream. Then Cars was sold to Hygieia three years later. The giant milk bottle has outlasted everything. It has stood the test of time and survived Hurricane Carla, Beulah, Celia, and every hurricane and tropical storm since then, including Tropical Storm Harold this past Tuesday. That's all our time for now. We do thank you for joining us for this special edition of Coastal Bend History. I'm Andy Lascano. Remember, you can see any of these stories and many more on our Coastal Bend History webpage. Just head to ChrisTV.com and you'll find the banner at the top of the page.